if you will give heed to this word this morning, you will understand your world, especially in light of all the headlines, like never before. I promise you, and it's not that I'm such a great expositor of God's word. It's just the word of God is clear. And what I'm going to do, I pray the Lord will use me to put it in order and in context so that you can have eyes to see. And many of you already do. Listen, everything I'm going to bring this morning over the decades I've been with you, I've preached sometimes over and over and over and over again, over the decades. So don't tune out, though, and say, well, we've heard it before. So no, 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 no. First of all, you don't remember it. Second of all, <laughs> second of all, thank you for those that laughed. You're saying amen, but you know, he said, God bless you. I love you. I love you guys. But, but second of all, there's going to be new stuff in this too. If you're not in the book of Esther, um, go ahead and turn there if you would. Oh, but the book of Esther is important. You will see. Right out of today's, and in just the past six or seven, eight years, headlines, you will see the direct biblical historical connection. It's right there, black and white. You'll see. I'm going to be referring to a whole lot of scripture, so I'm not going to have you turn to all of those. I will quote and even paraphrase some of those quotes and to give you the big picture and the big umbrella. And now we see how it's getting closer and closer to the return of the Lord. We don't set dates here, not at all. I'm going to give you some great biblical perspective this morning. But see, he knew what was coming. He Nothing has, he's not slapped his forehead and said, I didn't see any of this coming. <laughs> Most of what we're seeing is in his word. Some... All of the world today still think, well, that's, all, that's for a great, long, off future generation. You know, that's not about us. Oh, how wrong you are. Oh, how wrong you are. Ever since Israel came back to the land, we're going to get to this in a moment, the world has never been the same. It has been a source of contention for all of the nations, just like God said it would be. And he said, I'm going to bring them back. I'm going to put them there. And the nations of the world will hate it, but I will do this to show the nations of the world that I am God. I'm going to do something that has never happened with any other nation or people. Not only will I bring the nation back, but I will bring the people who have been scattered to all the nations back. Their language will be restored. See, the Hebrew language had been swallowed up in all the nation languages. And they were, con if you've ever heard of Yiddish, for example, that's an example we know. That's an, a, a mixture of, of Hebrew and other languages from where they were. And, and and there are various forms of that. They come back. The language has been restored. The historical understanding has been restored. They teach it in their colleges and universities. Most of the people speak it. Now we can go back to the ancient Hebrew. We've done archaeology. We're finding the archaeological remains of the Paleo-Hebrew, even the Proto-Sinatic Hebrew. I've done PowerPoints up here showing you the original scriptures written in Paleo-Hebrew and the pictures they make of Golgotha. It, it's so many other things. Unbelievable. I've done them. They're all over the internet for people that want to see them. All of those things have come to pass and so much more. And we're right in the middle of it all. And now the world's attention has turned to what's happening in Israel. And what happens in Israel is going to impact the entire world. It always has since it's been back, and it's only been back 75 years. I mean, there are people in this congregation that are 75 years age of age or older. So, I mean, some of you were here when that happened. People like me, I'm not there yet in age, but that's all I've ever known. It's, it's Israel. It's like, to me, it's been there for thousands of years. I read about it in the Bible, and there it is. Yeah, except there were 2,600 years when it went into captivity until 1948. And in all of our historical generation, Israel has been there. So I want you to follow with me. I'm going to do some context setting. I'm going to do a lot of teaching. 
And preaching as well, the difference between teaching and preaching. Preaching is just taking what you've taught and bringing it together under the, how, under the power of the Holy Spirit to get into your heart and your soul of how it applies to you, why it is relevant. The history you've learned, the context you've learned, that's cool, but this is not a history class. But you've got to know the history and you've got to know the context in order to say, oh my gosh, I see it. Because the only way you're going to have eyes to see and ears to hear is to understand the foundation, the context, the nuances of the language, and then to see what's going on in the world around you. One of the things about our day, Jesus said in Luke 17, he says, it's going to be just like the days of Noah. People eating and drinking and giving in marriage and buying and selling and trading right up to the day the flood came. Nothing wrong with eating and drinking and giving and marriage and buying and selling and trading. That's just life. What he meant was they're going to go about their lives without even realizing there's an aircraft carrier sized ship out on the plains in a man's backyard. Yeah, but he's a nut. Really? How'd that work out for you? He was a conspiracy theorist and a prepper who lived and who died. He was a man of God, a preacher of righteousness. The Bible says this, a prophet. He was giving people a way to be saved, and they turned from it and mocked him. Right in the opening pages of Genesis, we see how all this works. All last week, not every host and not everybody that was on the shows, but a bunch of them, they were in pure panic mode. Why is this happening? What's going on? Help us make some sense of it. And, and I had to be very careful because a lot of these folks are good people and they love the Lord. And a lot of them have ministries that are public and in media. And they should have known the answer. Number one, folks, hear me. That's why Jesus said, what does it profit a man to gain this whole world and then lose your soul? Number one, this world is belongs to Satan right now. How can they do that? And how can those terrorists do these atrocities? Because they are under Satan's grip. And before we put too much judgment on them, so is everyone, all eight billions. There are none who are righteous. No, not one, the Bible says. The only thing that makes us righteous, separated unto God, is the blood of Jesus Christ. That's it. That's it. You can give the Lord a hand anytime you want. So just get this perspective. And, and once, once I was able to sweetly help people, and you know when you're talking to hosts and stuff, you got to be careful because you don't want to, like it's their audience, and you don't want to say, have you not read your Bible? <laughs> but it's funny. You know, we do. We do read, read it, but then sometimes it kind of... <laughs> You know, we go out those doors and we're right back out there in the world and it's just like, okay, well, that was good stuff in there, but now I'm out here in the real world. Excuse me, the real world is what the Word of God speaks of. And this world is really kind of fakish in that Satan has polluted it. He has thrown truth to the ground. Have you noticed? You want to talk about little boys and little girls? <laughs> He's thrown truth to the ground. Supreme Court justices that say, I don't know what a woman is. I'm not a biologist. <laughs> Truth to the ground. Lawlessness is prevailing. Does this look like a world where King Jesus is on the throne? No, but that day is coming. Amen. It is coming. Jesus taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth one day as it is in heaven right now. That's, 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 that's what we're living for, supposed to be. People all over the world, well, I'm saved. What does that mean? Well, I'm not going to hell. So you got fire insurance, right? <laughs> that explains why you live like you do. It's, it's not what salvation is about. That's one of the wonderful benefits. But it's about not only escaping the coming wrath of God that's coming upon this world, like the flood, like the fire that fell from heaven in Lot's day, the wrath of God, those that were saved, escaped that. Are you following me? But it's also about 
the coming of God's kingdom and the restoration of all of this like it was in the beginning before sin polluted it all. And we, the Bible says, New Testament, we are then joint heirs with Jesus of all that he has created. Malek HaOlam, the king of the universe, has said, it was always yours. I created it for you. Satan stole it from you. I got it back. And I'm going to one day present it to you as the biggest Christmas gift you've ever gotten. Amen. That's what salvation is. It's not about, well, I went to church, heard a sermon, shook the preacher's hand, praise God. I'm okay. I got fire insurance, not going to hell, not go live like I want. Please hear, that's the perspective. We've got such a warped understanding of what this is all about. The Word of God tells us from beginning to end. We're going to wind up in Esther 3 in just a moment, but, um, but listen to me as I put it together. Here's what's happening. Now, I'm going to start with ancient history, but my gosh, it's just right in our laps right now. I'm going to start with that. I'm going to go, I'm not misusing the word literally here. I'm going to go literally from Genesis to Revelation. And I want you to see that the story of what we're living in was foretold all the way through in great detail. In detail that if you've never heard this before, it's going to sound a little freaky to you. Because when it unfolds right before you, you're going to say, oh my gosh, I did not know that. Follow me. A lot of it some of you will already know. Go all the way back to Genesis. Go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Go all the way back to chapter 3. There's where we learn about the fall from the last day of creation to the day of, the, of God's rest. And that didn't mean he was tired. It just means he ceased his creative activity to the Garden of Eden. There's a, there's a space in there. It just ends at chapter 2 and starts in chapter 3. We don't know how long it was. It could have been 100 years. It could have been thousands of years. But somewhere in there. Most scholars think that it was at least 100 years and maybe several thousand years between the time God said, and he looked and behold, now all was good. And on that day he rested. And then the next verse, chapter 3, now the serpent, that's how the first words of chapter 3 open, the craftiest of everything God had created, entered into the garden and said, I'm paraphrasing, Eve. And by the way, lest the women think, oh gosh, this is a sermon against women. <laughs> the Bible says, and Adam was with her. The two of them, Satan says, I got something for you. You can be like me. You can be like the angelic realm. You can be like God himself. Satan's the first one to speak up. Bless her heart. Excuse me, Eve was the first one to speak up to Satan. Bless her heart. We're not supposed to do this. God says we'll die if we do this. The first false prophecy and the first lie was from Satan. Next, he says, you will not die. Now the whole world is filled with death, and it's the thing that the entire world fears as number one. Hebrews chapter 2 says the fear of death is Satan's power over the world. But that power has been loosened and the grip has been destroyed by the blood of Jesus and salvation that was offered. It goes all the way back to the garden. Now let me move along quickly. Now follow me. Genesis 3.15, in the garden, God's saying, Eve, here's what, what's going to happen to you. Here, Adam, here's what's going to happen to you. And then he calls Nachash, the serpent. It's Satan. Revelation 12 tells us that ancient serpent is the devil or Satan. So he calls Satan to him, and he says, listen to me, big boy. From the womb of a woman will come a male child that will crush your kingdom. Satan was enraged. He went berserk. You can see it all the rest of the way through the Bible. You can see it today. You can see it everywhere. He knew what was going to happen to him, and he knew why. But 
but he didn't know how, when, where, or exactly through whom. And the rest of his existence has been about all of that. And we're caught right up in this whole story. You move through the Bible. Satan's looking for the seed. He's looking for the male child. How do you do that when the earth is becoming populated exponentially over thousands of years? When there are hundreds and hundreds of millions and then eventually maybe some billions. And there's a lot of women giving birth to male children. How do you know? Is he going to destroy my kingdom as an infant? That's not likely. Maybe as a young man, maybe. Maybe as an older man, maybe. I don't know. Maybe as an elderly man, I don't know. He, I, I don't have a clue. So he's looking, he's looking. And we see that all the way through the scriptures. Then we hear God take a man called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees, the Chaldean Empire, Iraq, Iran. He pulls him out. He puts him in the middle of Canaan land. He calls it the promised land. He says, this will be the inheritance for you and all of your seed. And from your seed, the entire earth will be blessed. Amen. Now, I'm not talking about political Israel. I'm not talking about the sinner Jews or the sinner Gentiles that were a part of Israel. I'm talking about God's promise that through this man, you say, well, why did he choose him? Because he's God and he can choose anybody. That's who he chose. And so we know from the seed of Abraham came Isaac and Esau. But watch. We watch this. And we watch the children and the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren from this man. Satan goes somewhere along the line. Aha. It's one of those seed. Now I've got it narrowed down to this group of people. Then you find that through the course of humanity and all the events, Satan's not God. He can't snap his fingers and make things happen. He has to manipulate things. He has to maneuver things. He has to get in people's heads. He has to pull people's hearts and heartstrings. This is spiritual battle continually in the unseen realm. We're watching it right in front of our face right now. But this is what happens. He knows now where it's coming from. See, that blessing to the world is when Satan's kingdom is crushed. But first there had to be a people, and that people would have to bring forth prophets, and those prophets would have to bring forth the word of God, and the prophecies would have to be about the coming of the Messiah and the coming of our salvation and the coming of the new kingdom and the and the destruction of the old kingdom. So the word of God came, the prophets came, the prophecies came, and out of that came the fulfillment of all of that. And Messiah did come, and he did go to the cross, which was prophesied. He did rise from the grave, which was prophesied. The church was born, which is in the Old Testament prophesied. The nation of Israel brought all of this about, and the gospel was formed in the new covenant, Jeremiah 31, 31. I will bring forth a new covenant. I will write my word on their hearts. That did come through the birth of the church and the the preaching of the gospel. Everything that was said there came from them, but Satan didn't know this then. He's not God. He's not omniscient. He doesn't know everything, but he knows a lot more than we do. So he sees these people. They wind up in Egypt because of famine through Joseph. You remember? His father thinks he's dead. He sends his brothers into Egypt to get some relief. They wind up before Joseph, who now is second in command in Egypt. First, he was captured and sold as a slave. Then he winds up in prison. Then he gets out. And then he winds up second in command next to Pharaoh himself. And now his brothers are coming to him for relief, which matches the dream he had in Genesis 37. Is everybody with me? Amen. Now, I'm going to move it quicker, but I just got to start here because it starts right here. Then the children of Israel moved to Egypt, and before long, they multiply, and they're everywhere. And before long, there's a Pharaoh that rises up that knows not Joseph, the Bible says, and takes those Israelites, those children of, of Israel, those children of Jacob, they take them and put them in slavery, make slaves out of them. They capture them. 
began to persecute them. 400 years they're in slavery, but what happens along the line? There was a Pharaoh that rose up and said, you know what? We need to kill all the male children of these Israelites. Gee, who do you think gave him that idea? Do you see the demonic? Do you see the satanic? All the male children. That's how Moses, the whole, you can see the whole account of Moses and how he escaped that. And so anyway, he grows up and he's raised in Pharaoh's house through a chain of events. You'll have to read that on your own. But he's the one that God uses to bring forth the delivery of the Passover and going out into the wilderness and going before Mount Sinai. And when the law is given, the nation of Israel is born, but they're still wandering together as a herd of people for 40 years in the wilderness until they finally get into the promised land and they go in under Joshua. Moses is not allowed to go. There are reasons it's in the Bible. And they finally go in under Joshua. But in those 40 years in the wilderness... I want you to remember this. The first people who came out into the wilderness were the Amalekites. The Amalekites are descendants of Esau. These are the current Arab people of today versus the Jewish people of the day, and they're all related from Abraham. That's why the Muslims say, Abraham's our father too. Amen. The first people who came out. Don't do it now, but in Exodus 17, this is where you see Moses having to raise up his staff and Aaron having to hold his arms up. Remember, if those of you that have been students of the word, because he was, because as long as that staff was up, they would win. As long as the staff was down, they were losing. Aaron held his staff up. They beat the Amalekites. They shouldn't have, but supernaturally they did. And then in chapter 17, I'm paraphrasing, but God says, write this down. I will always be against the Amalekites. And in the end of days, I will eliminate them all. Because they have turned against me and against my people. It's in Exodus chapter 17. The Amalekites. There were clans among the Amalekites. One of those clans was called the Agites. They were part of the Amalekites. So, the nation of Israel is formed. There's Saul, David, Solomon. You know all of that. Solomon dies. The nation goes through a civil war between the north and the south. Gee. <laughs> but they're split. The northern kingdom is called Israel, its capital at Samaria. The southern kingdom is called Judah, with its capital at Jerusalem. We read through the books, Kings, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, and then 1 Kings, 2 Kings. And then we read what happens there. The northern kingdom is attacked by a huge empire that's coming out of Iraq and Iran in our modern day terms. It's called the Assyrian Empire. They want that whole area, but they take, they want to take the northern kingdom first, conquer it, then they want to come in and take the southern kingdom. So they conquer the, first, the northern kingdom, they take ten tribes into captivity. Then they turn their sight on the southern kingdom. This is where Isaiah steps in, he takes the king and he takes him to the temple and they pray and they ask God to bless. And God does, and he turns the Assyrians back. Anyway, they go through succession after succession of kings. In the southern kingdom, Jerusalem, Judah. But there's another empire on the rise that will defeat the Assyrian Empire. It will be known as the Babylonian Empire. King Nebuchadnezzar will eventually be one of its kings. He comes from the Chaldean line. You know where Abraham was called out of. The Chaldean were known throughout the Bible as extremely wicked, occultic people relishing in the demonic. So Nebuchadnezzar lays siege to Jerusalem. The day he lays siege was the ninth of Tammuz. I've told you this before. That corresponds on our calendar to June the 26th in the year 2015. A lot happened in that year. You'll see in a moment. On June the 26th, 2015, the United States of America, the largest Christian nation in the world, the Supreme Court ruled that we don't know what a marriage is anymore. And now look where we are. 
We don't know what a little boy is. We don't know what a little girl is. We don't know when to keep our hands off of them. We don't know what a woman is. We don't know what a man is. We've been given over to a depraved mind. It all happened June 26, 2015, corresponding with the date Nebuchadnezzar breached the walls of Jerusalem, eventually destroyed the temple, eventually owned both the northern and the southern kingdoms, eventually took the people outside and slaughtered most of them. But they took the young men, male children, they killed a bunch of them, and the rest they put into the service of the emperor. Tried to turn them all into pagans. I'm so glad that our current culture is not trying to turn our children into pagans, aren't y'all? It's the same demonic spirit, guys. Y'all follow me? Follow me? So all of that happens. There is no more Israel, no more temple. It's gone. But there's another empire on the rise. This is the largest empire the globe had ever seen up until that time, and one of the largest the globe has ever seen. It became known as the Persian Empire, first the Medio Persian Empire, then the Persian Empire. By the time we opened the book of, of Esther, Xerxes is the king. He's the one that would defeat the Greek Empire eventually. But the Persian Empire rises up and swallows up everything from the Assyrian and Babylonian Empire, and the Jews are now in the Persian Empire. It was a Persian, Persian king, Darius and Cyrus, that eventually allowed the Jews to return to their homeland. They could rebuild the city and the walls and eventually even the temple if they wanted. A bunch of Jews returned, a whole lot of them. Most of them didn't because they were so assimilated into the cultures. But there they were. So now the Persian Empire. It's modern-day Iran, Iraq, all of India, all of the Middle East, and a big chunk of Africa. That was the Persian Empire. Until 1935, on every globe and on every map in our children's textbooks, there was a big chunk of land on the maps and on the globes. It was called Persia. 1935, they changed their name, and so the globes and the maps were changed to Iran. Okay? Is everybody with me? You ain't heard nothing yet. Go to Esther chapter 3. All right, here's the deal, very, very quickly. So Xerxes is the king. He's got a queen named Vashti. Vashti. Um. It starts off with talking about how he's got 127 nations that are now a part of it. They call provinces, but they're, most of them are what would be called nations that are part of his empire. They have several capitals. One of them was at Susa. That was the main one in, in what's now modern-day Iran area. But they had other capitals because the empire was so huge. So to govern these people, they had to have a massive military, and they had several centers of government capitals, if you will, okay? So in the opening pages, you discover about King Xerxes or Ahureus in some of your Bibles, and that is um, it's an English pronunciation. It's a Latin pronunciation of the Hebrew word, and I'm not going to bore you with the Hebrew word of his name. Sometimes you'll see Arctic Xerxes. Um, it, the, the, what that is, Xerxes is a title, Ahureus probably was his name. Xerxes means uh, um, uh, the great one, the majesty, the king. Artaxerxes means like king of kings, if you will. And there was Artaxerxes, there's Xerxes one, Xerxes two, Artaxerxes one, two, three, all through their history. You don't need to know all that. I'm just telling you that you're opening the pages into that. Vashti, his queen, was deposed. She felt like the king had insulted her, and she told everybody, well, the king was like a god, so he just put her out. But he needed a new queen. We discover how that happened. They had, if you will, I'm going to oversimplify it, but they, the king declared to have a huge beauty contest all over the empire. And they were going to pick the most beautiful one and the one that had the most pleasant personality to go with it and all of that. And that 
woman would be chosen as the new queen under Xerxes, the most powerful man. He's like a god on the planet. Basically owned all of the known world. In the meantime, there are a lot of Jews living in the area, especially in the capital city, Susa. There was a man named Mordecai, who was an important guy. He sat in the city gates among some of the elders. People listened to him. He had some say in the city government. His cousin, much younger than him, little, little girl, mother and father died. Her name was Hadassah. He took her as an infant and raised her as his daughter. It was really her cousin, but he raised her and treated her as a daughter. She grew into a, a young woman and was the age to be in the beauty contest. And she was gorgeous. And she was sweet. And she was loving and kind. She won the beauty contest. Winds up being the queen. In the meantime, Xerxes doesn't know she's a Jewish woman. In the meantime, we run into another character. We're going to see him in, in chapter 3. A man by the name of Haman. The word Haman in Hebrew, and this is in the Hebrew dictionaries. You can look them up again. I, I, I was going to read all the sources to you. Just trust me. I know what I'm talking about. It's, it's a name. It's a name. And the only place you find it is in the book of Esther. It's found about 53 times, I think, 54 times. But you also see it found as an adjective or even a verb in the Hebrew. The adjective is, um, or excuse me, that wouldn't be, yeah, enraged, an enraged one or something like that. Enraged or to be enraged, to be turbulent. And you find that word actually used. There's one verse. It's in chapter 3, verse 6. Uh, you, you can look and, and, and at that one verse right now. But it says something about, and then Haman became enraged or, or furious or whatever. But in the Hebrew, it says, and Haman became Haman. <laughs> well, see, it's his name, but now he's going to live up to his name. Does that make sense? It's like if we name a girl Joy. Right? Or faith or hope or something like that. You know, it's a name, but it also has a meaning that describes that person. That's what Haman is. Now, that's important. Way more than you think. Look at chapter 3. Now, after all of these other events and things, but you'll, you can go read all this on your own. Esther's, oh, oh and, and, and Hadassah, her name is changed to Esther, the Persian name, which means a star. It's the Persian word for star, Esther. After these events, King Xerxes honored Haman, the Agagite, the Agagite from the tribe of the Amalekites. So now you know who he is. He's a great, 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 great grandson of Esau. Xerxes elevated him and gave him a seat of honor higher than all the other nobles in the empire. All the royal officials at the king's gate knelt down and paid honor to Haman, for the king had commanded this concerning him. But Mordecai, the Jew, would not kneel down or pay him honor. The royal officials at the king's gates asked Mordecai, why do you disobey the king's command? Day after day they spoke to him, but he refused to comply. Therefore they told Haman about it to see whether Mordecai's behavior would be tolerated. For Mordecai had told them he was a Jew. Now when Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay honor, he was enraged. It's where it says Haman, well that's verse 5, I'm sorry. But Haman became Haman. Verse 6, yet having learned who Mordecai's people were, the Jews, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. In other words, there was going to be a holocaust that would wipe all the Jews off the face of the earth. 
in Persia under Haman. Is everybody with me? Oh, this gets much deeper. Are you following from the Garden of Eden, Abraham's seed, Egypt, kill all the boys, Babylon, kill all the boys and take the rest of them and pervert them, Persia, just kill them all. Just kill them all. But something had to happen, though. This is Satan. Do you see the spiritual warfare Paul talked about in Ephesians 6 when he said, our battle's not against flesh and blood. You see it in flesh and blood. But our battle is against darkness and wickedness in the unseen realms. Verse 6, verse 7. In the twelfth year of King Xerxes, in the first month, the month of Nisan, this is important, they cast the pur, that is the lot. That's why this would all become known as the Feast of Purim, casting the lots. In the presence of Haman to select a day and a month to kill all the Jews. And the lot fell on the twelfth month, the month of Adar. That's in the Hebrew calendar. Then Haman said to King Xerxes, <clears throat> King, there's a certain people dispersed and scattered among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom whose customs are so different from ours, from those of all the other people. They don't obey the king's laws. It's not in the king's best interest to even tolerate them. If it pleases the king, let a decree be issued to destroy them all. And I will put 10,000 talents of silver into the royal treasury for the men who carry out this business. Verse 10. So the king took his signet ring, this would be Xerxes, from his finger, gave it to Haman, the enraged one, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. This is in Persia, guys. Keep the money, the king said to Haman, and do with the people however you please. Now listen to this date. Then on the 13th day of the first month, that would be the month of Nis Nisan, in the Hebrew calendar. That's when Passover is. Choose your lamb on the 10th and on the 14th day, slaughter him. Everybody with me? Okay. On the 13th day of the first month, he sent the royal secretaries. They were summoned. They wrote out the script, each province, in the language of each people, all Haman's orders to the king's satraps, the governors. The satrap is like a sheriff, if you will, the law enforcement of the area. The governors of the various provinces and the nobles of the various peoples. These were written in the name of King Xerxes himself and sealed on the 13th day of Nisan. Dispatches were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with the order to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and little children, on a single day, the 13th day of the month of Adar. So here, what, here's what you have. In April, March, April, 13th day of Nisan, he gets up and makes an announcement. We're going to kill all the Jews, and we're going to do it 11 months from now on a single day. Everybody get ready. Keep reading. Verse 14, a copy of the text of the edict was to be issued as law to every province and made known to the people of every nationality so they'd be ready for that day. Spurred on by the king's command, the couriers went out. The edict was issued in the citadel of Susa. The king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was bewildered. They'd been getting along just fine with the Jews all throughout the kingdom. And now there was going to be a mass extermination of hundreds of thousands of people on a specific day because Haman got the king to go along with it. On the 13th of Nisan, he announced to the world, this is what's going to be done. We, well, we know the rest of the story. It, it, it finally failed. And the bottom line is the king found out his wife was a Jew. <laughs> She set the whole thing up, and in a way, you read the, read the account later. Later, not now while I'm preaching. I know. See, all of a sudden, you love the Bible. Okay, all right. Just just wait. All right, but 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 he does, and and so when the king finds out, he takes Haman. Haman had had gallows built to celebrate this thing. Was going to kill Mordecai on it. 
the king ordered Haman to be killed on his own gallows. And the Jews to this day celebrate their feast called Purim. And they recite and read from the book of Esther. Every time the name Haman is mentioned, they cry out, boo, boo. You know, it's just a part of the celebration. The little kids get involved and everything else. Follow me there. Greeks killed a bunch. Then the Romans come along. Well, they live fairly peacefully among the Romans until 70 AD. Of course, that's when God stepped in in the flesh, in the person of Jesus Christ. The Persians had invented crucifixion. The Romans had perfected it to the most hideous way to die known to humanity. That's when God stepped in, put on flesh. The word became flesh. And Jesus said, I will become your substitute by dying the most hideous way of death man has ever invented. I won't just take your sin upon you. I will become your sin. I will become the scapegoat. Are you all following me? In 70 AD, the Romans came in, destroyed the temple. That would be the second temple. Drove all the Jews out of the land unto the nations. And they stayed scattered until the late 1800s. They started trickling back. And in 1948, in one day, May the 14th, 1948, they said, we are Israel and we're back. 75 years they've been there. Who attacked them by land, air, and sea? Gaza? Who are they? Mm, the world calls them Palestinians. The word Palestine, Palestinian, came from the ancient Greeks. They called that area of Gaza and, and all around it. It was much bigger than they called it Palestine. or That's a Latin word. That would come under the Romans. They had their Greek name for it. But it meant Philistines and... And, and, and the Arabs and the Greeks, a lot of Greeks moved into that area and they mixed and mingled with them and had children and grandchildren by them. A lot of the Cretans from the island of Crete, they moved into that area. So you had this conglomeration of people that was Gaza. But by the time the Romans ran the Jews out unto the nations, they renamed that whole area, that whole area. Palestine, the land of the Philistines. And they did that on purpose because they were hoping the Jews would be so repulsed by that that they would never want to come back to that land. Is everybody with me? When I was a kid back in the ancient, ancient days, the Americans that lived in that region were called Palestinian Americans. You didn't know that, did you? Yeah. The French were called the French Palestinians, the British Palestinians. The Arab Palestinians, the Jewish Palestinians. Today, the news, they're so, they don't know. They're, the Palestinian people. Well, which ones? The Palestinians. Well, who are they? The Palestinians. They're misusing the word totally. But that's not what the sermon's about. Anyway, here's what I want you to know. The first people to attack Israel or in, in, this, in this war, the, the worst war they've had in over 50 years and may turn out to be the worst one ever, was Hamas. The word Hamas is Hebrew. It's where the word Haman comes from. Hamas, the first time you find it, it's in the book of Genesis, chapter 6. I think that's verse 5. Where it says, Ch chapter 6, verse 1 says, And in, in those days, the sons of God, speaking of the angelic realm, the fallen ones, came unto the daughters of men and had children by them. We don't really know what all that means, but there was a demonic outpouring that changed everything. This is what brought the flood on. And it said, and there were giants in the land in those days. And violence and cruelty filled the land. Do you know what the word for violence and cruelty is? Hamas. Hamas. It's a Hebrew word. 
you pronounce it with a little bit of guttural stop. It's, it was spelled in English C H A M A S, but in it's ha, ha, Hamas, cruelty and violence. Haman's name, to be enraged, the enraged one, to bring this cruelty and violence, the one who want to kill all the Jews. Do you understand how ancient this is? So, Hamas, that word is used 65 times throughout the Old Testament, and it's always translated to cruelty or violence. All through the Psalms it's used. These are men of violence surround me. The word says men of Hamas surround me. It says that. Okay, now watch. <sighs> Let's come right up into our day. I already told you what happened on June 26, 2015. This is a pivotal year. <sighs> the 9th of Tammuz, our Supreme Court said. That's the day the Babylonian spirit entered into America. I'm going to tell you something. When you get to the book of Revelation, the book of last things, chapter 15 and 16 talk about the seven bowls of God's wrath. Chapter 17 and 18 is a closer look at that. And it says God's wrath is aimed at mystery Babylon. The other word for Babylon is Chaldean. It's aimed at the demonic realm known as the Chaldean spirits. That's why Brother Zev Peratt wrote a book called Unmasking the Chaldean Spirit. You need to read that. So now that we know from Genesis and Exodus, it's that demonic spirit. Kill the kids, kill the kids, kill the kids. What do you think the whole abortion holocaust has been all about? It's a global, the number one cause of death on the planet to this day. 100 million children every day single year. There were only 60 million people killed in all of World War II. We have a World War II holocaust on this planet every year for decades. Satan is aimed at the children. What was this attack aimed at? Women and children to shock the world. Are y'all following me? Can you see it? If you have eyes to see, you can see it. It's a string that goes through the word of God, and God's warned us all for those that have eyes to see. 2015, we brought the Babylon spirit into America. Now we've got people running our government that don't even know what day it is, and they don't even know where they are. We've been given over to deranged minds. Romans chapter 1. Watch. 2015. In March of 2015, now I'm going to name names of politicians and stuff. This is not a political, I'm just history. It's, it's history. It's in the history books. It's in mainstream media. You get on Google, you might have to go back a few pages or to the Wayback Machine, or sometimes it'll come right up to the front when you enter in the, the proper uh, terminology, search terminology, but it's all there. It's all documented. So when I call names, I'm not speaking of political issues at all who to vote for, who not to vote for, I'm not. I'm just saying, here's the truth. Can you handle the truth? Okay, okay, I knew you could, amen. All right, now watch. 2015. Go back to March of 2015. Remember June 2015 is when the Supreme Court ruled. March 2015. March the 3rd. President was Barack Obama. He had already announced to the world that he was going to do what we now know as the Iranian nuclear deal. What it was, they had assets frozen. Many nations of the world had about 150 on the high side, um, anywhere from 75 billion to 150 billion dollars of Iranian assets frozen in banks all over the world because they were working hard to get nuclear weapons. They're in compact with Russia. You know, Magog. Ezekiel 38. Persia in contact, in contract. They're in contract and have been since the 90s. Russia promised Iran they would feed them nuclear technology. Iran promised Russia that they would do their very best to help fight radical 
Islamic terrorism in Russia and to keep it out. So Russia and Iran made this pact. It's the Russia-Iran Treaty. I can't remember the exact dates in the 1990s. But when it became apparent to the world and to world powers that Iran was in the process of building nuclear weapons or trying to, and then their presidents and mullahs were going in front of television cameras saying, when we get a nuclear weapon, we're using it first on Israel. We want to kill them all. Where's that spirit coming from? Persia. Haman. The Amalekites. Do you see the line? Iran sponsors two main terrorist groups, Hezbollah in the north and Hamas in Gaza and in the south. All of them, they hate the returned Israel. They want it gone. So we froze the assets. Obama goes into office. He wants to unfreeze them because he's made a deal. Now, never mind that his chief of staff was born in Iran. I can't remember her name right now, but they want to unfreeze the Iranian assets because he's worked out a deal and they have promised, they have pinky swore that they will not build nuclear weapons. So not only did they release all of that money eventually, but Obama also arranged for, I think it was $1.7 billion of cash to be flown in to Tehran and left it on the tarmac in big crates. Y'all remember all that? All right. Right before that happened, though, March the 3rd, Benjamin Netanyahu was the prime minister of Israel. He saw what was going on. In 2011, Arab Spring had taken place, had changed the whole Middle East, the whole face of the Middle East. Dictators were overthrown, and caliphates were put in their place, Muslim caliphates. Netanyahu screamed back then. He said, what are y'all doing? The New York Times ran articles talking about Obama and Hillary Clinton were the architects of Arab Spring, and New York Times praised them. You can look it up on the Internet. 2015, Netanyahu's begging to have an audience with Obama in the White House. Obama can't stand him. Obama criticizes him, trashes him, mocks him will not invite him to the White House. He knows that they're getting ready to make a deal to give Iran $150 billion, maybe that much. It might not be that much, but it's billions. It's like 75 to $100 billion. And then, he, he, and then Obama sweetened it up and gave a couple more billion in cash, dropped it off on the airport tarmac. I, but Netanyahu didn't know exactly what was going to happen, but he knew that Obama was in talks with these deals and power brokers among the world. And he says, please let me come. Let me tell you what's going on. Let me tell you. They wouldn't. He wouldn't do it. In the meantime, Congress, the House was controlled by John Boehner, a Republican, so to speak. And John Boehner invited Netanyahu to Congress to speak. On March the 3rd, 2015, Netanyahu went to the pulpit of Congress of the largest superpower the planet has ever seen. And he spoke to the leadership of that super, superpower. Obama wouldn't come. Obama sat in the Oval Office, watched it on TV, and mocked him. Used curse words. It was printed in the paper what he said. They thought it was funny. He cursed Israel. What's the Bible say about that? Okay, watch. Netanyahu, on March 3rd, said, I have come to you. You can read his transcripts. I'm going to paraphrase them, but here's what he said. In the middle of the Feast of Purim, March 3rd of 2015, I'm begging you. You are getting ready. Your leadership is getting ready to hand our ancient enemies, the people who want us gone and tried to kill every Jew. They, did, they tried to do something that was bigger than the Nazi Holocaust. By the way, Adolf Hitler was connected to all of this. He was connected to the Muslim Brotherhood. We've got pictures on the Internet of them meeting, and his promise was he would kill all the Jews all over the world so that they could never come back to the Promised Land. 
Adolf Hitler and the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood came out of Hamas. Are y'all following me? I just want you to know what's happening. Otherwise, you say, oh, Israel's having another war. You ain't got a clue if that's your answer to people. You don't have a clue. But today, you're going to get the clue. Watch. March the 3rd, I'm getting ready to say something that's going to shock you. 2015, Benjamin Netanyahu is begging Congress, please change Obama's mind. Please change his mind. And then he quotes from the book of Esther. And he tells them all this stuff that you read here and everything else. And he goes through and he says, this is what happened. This is they, they wanted to kill us then. They've always wanted to kill us. And he goes down through the Greeks and the Romans and, the, you know, he goes down through it all. He goes all the way back to Egypt and comes all the way through to Babylon and Assyria. He shows them everything like I'm doing here. And he begs, please don't do this. Please don't do this. Please, we will fight them. It's, it's, it, this, is, this is going to bring about World War III. Congress was moved. Obama sent a message by March 31st, I will have this thing signed and announced to the world. I'm going to do this. So Netanyahu makes this big speech. Obama mocks him. March 31st comes and nothing happens. People are thinking, wow. April the 2nd, 2015, Obama steps in front of the world and says, we are releasing all the funds to Iran. Hebrew calendar, the 13th of Nisan, the day that Haman signed the compact with Artaxerxes and made the announcement to all of Persia, we're going to kill all the Jews. Amen. The same day, Obama changed it to that day. I don't know if he knew what he was doing or if it was just Satan up in his head, but that's not a coincidence, folks. Now, who's attacking Israel as we sit here today? Iran, Persia, the Amalekites, Hamas, Hezbollah. What are they doing? Killing, raping, murdering women and children. Others, too, but I mean, that's their... That's their thing. What were they going to do in the Persian Empire? Kill them all. Women and children were listed first. Then by the time we get to Revelation, we read about Mystery Babylon is what God's going to pour. He's going to pour his wrath out on. But then last week, I told you, you stop at Revelation 12, which is right in the middle. And the very last words, it tells you what Satan's up to. He says, and he goes off to make war against the woman that gave birth to that male child who rules the nations. Well, the woman is Israel. That's what she's called. That's what the Israel is called all the way through the Bible. The woman that gave birth, that brought forth the prophecies and the prophets and then the actual Messiah and then the crucifixion and the resurrection and the birth of the church and the preaching of the gospel and the changing of the world. And then heaven's throne brought Israel back and stuck it in my face. So now I'm making war against that woman that has come back, comma, and all of those who hold to the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's in the book of Revelation. You know, that old ancient book of 2,000 years old that has no relevance to our day. You know, that Old Testament we need to just ignore and throw away. That's that Jewish stuff. Not in this church. It never has been. It's the Word of God. And it is happening before our eyes. Now, we go to Ezekiel 37 and 38. Chapter 37, read it on your own, the valley of the dry bones. It's a prophecy where God says, in the last days, I'll bring back my people. They will come from all the lands. I will bring them back. I will raise them up. I will put them in the land. The land will flourish. They will then be under one king and not two. See, because when Israel collapsed, it had a civil war and there were two kings. Now there's one king, a prime minister, a president, a, a Knesset, a Congress. It's one king, if you will. Those words, Knesset and Congress and presidents and, and, and prime ministers, those were not, those are not, those are our modern words. So that's what it is. We're watching it. It's right there. That's chapter 37. I'll bring it back. 1948, it happened. 38, 
opens by saying, now, in those days when that nation is back and it is prosperous, there's never been a nation that's 75 years old that is as prosperous as that nation. Most of your cell phone and computer technology was invented in Israel. It's unbelievable. These people are brilliant as a whole, as a people. God has blessed them. When they came back to that land in 1948, it was desert wasteland. Go look at the pictures on the internet. They'll show you pictures of what it looked like in 1948. And then right beside it, you'll see what that same piece of property, and I don't mean an acre or two, I mean miles and miles from on top of the mountains and satellites looking down, flourishing, flourishing and forest and beauty and fruits and vegetables. And it's unbelievable. The land came back to life. In 75 years, the world has been changed, and the nations, the nations around them hate them. The first day they declared independence, five Muslim nations attacked them. 19 months later, Israel had won, and they've been there for 75 years. They've had four major wars since then, this one being the worst of them all. And it's just beginning. So Ezekiel 37 says, I'm going to bring them back. Ezekiel 38 says, and when they're back... And when they're prospering, there will be an alliance of nations. I'm going to use the modern names. Russia, Iran, Turkey, parts of Africa, big chunks of the Middle East. They will join together in alliance and they will attack Israel. I don't set dates in this church. And I'm not saying that prophecy is exactly what's happening today. But if it's not, it is the beginning of it. Because who are the major players? Iran, Haman, Hamas killed them all. Women and children killed them all. Iran, when we get nukes, we're wiping them out. A week before all these attacks occurred, Biden gave six billion more dollars to Iran. We can't close our own borders and protect our people, but we can give Persia $6 billion so they can funnel it to Hamas and Hezbollah. Do you understand why I keep saying this world is not our home, folks? People get mad at me sometimes. Say, well, yeah, it is. God meant for us to. No, he meant for us to enjoy it, but we're supposed to be ambassadors, kingdoms, a, a, a priest of, of, of his kingdom. But you've got to have that perspective. You've got to understand who we are and what's getting ready to happen sometime. Sometime, maybe a hundred years from now, I don't set dates. I don't do that. But I know what God's word said. Can you tell? Yeah. I went from Genesis to Revelation. I left out a bunch of stuff. I know what God's word says, and I know what it says in context. I know what the headline news say. I know what happened in Congress. I know what happened before that. I know what happened since then. I know the dates that are connected to biblical dates that are like, oh, my gosh, that's too coincidental to be coincidental. And so I can see the big picture. There is a passage in Psalm 25, I think it is. It's not really important right now, but, it, but it's quoted again in Hebrews 3. And it says, today, if you have heard the voice of God, harden not your hearts. He is our God. We are his people. We are are the sheep of his pasture. Amen. He is our shepherd. Oh my gosh. I told you all of this, and some people are thinking, you know, I didn't want to hear that. I know you don't want to. I know we don't want to hear it. But this, but if, you've, if you're making this earth we live on right now, well, this is all that there is to life. No, then you're sorely disappointed, and that's why you don't like hearing this. But if you understand the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation, it's all been told. It's all there. That's why First Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul tells the church in Thessalonica, that day of judgment is coming, and it will take the world like a thief in the night, but you you will not be surprised like a thief in the night because you are children of the light. Well, how are we children of the light? By knowing his word in context. This one message this morning that Satan didn't want you to hear. This one message has taken Genesis to Revelation, connected the dots in context, brought you right into the own halls of our Congress, into the own halls of our White House, right into what's happening in Israel today, connecting perfectly right down to the word Hamas and Haman and Netanyahu on Purim in our Congress saying that this day was coming, and here it is. 
which is why Netanyahu has just announced, and I'm not making him some savior, and I don't worship him. I'm just watching things unfold. I'm calling it like what's in the news. That's why he said, this war we cannot lose. We will not lose. We will do whatever it takes. Now, before they had said, they're the number one nuclear superpower in the Middle East, y'all. And they're one of the biggest superpowers on the planet because they're backed by the United States and Great Britain, and plus they've got their own nuclear arsenal. When you guys sent Pam and I to Israel on our 10th anniversary here, 27 years ago, our tour guide and everybody over there told us that the, the slogan, the motto of every Israeli, and we heard many of them say it, two words, never again. Amen. And they were speaking of the Holocaust, never again. We will push the red button on everybody if we have to. But we are not going back to ovens. Hamas spirit is there. Haman's spirit is there. It's being fed by Persia spirit. Do you understand? This is why we need to pray for this world. We need to pray for the people of Israel. We need to pray for the innocent ones. The world calls them Palestinians for the Arabs, the Jews, the Muslims, the Christians, the unbelievers, the atheists. We need to pray for people because I don't know when a date is, but I can see it doing this now. It's coming closer and closer. Now, for those of us, and I'm not talking down to anybody, I'm hoping you will come to the Lord. And we're not going to manipulate anybody. It's not going to be anything silly or stupid. We do here. Don't worry about that. Just listen to me. For those of us that are born again under the blood, we know the word or we're getting to know the word. We get it. This kind of understanding, it gives us understanding. We say, okay, I see. And I can help people understand. It, it should not cause fear. Oh, does it disturb us a little bit to see all this? Does it break our hearts? We're like Lot standing outside of his door watching Sodom and Gomorrah go down the toilet. And his heart is broken. Peter says Lot, in his, his vex, he was vexed in his righteous heart looking at the sin day by day parading by his door. Noah, same thing in his day. Jesus said in Luke 17, the days before the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah and just like the days of Lot. Amen. And they're already here, guys. The largest Christian nation on the planet, on the 9th of Tammuz, the Supreme Court said, we don't know what a marriage is anymore. On the 13th of Nisan, the president of the largest Christian nation on the planet signed a pact with Israel's mortal enemies, which enables them to have nuclear weapons, which they have promised when we get them, we're destroying Israel. I've been telling you for 37 years, when Israel returned, like God's word said, the hour clock was turned upside down and the sand started pushing through. It's God's time clock. We don't know the day or the hour. We just know that we need to live our lives knowing what's going on. If you're here this morning and you've been playing with this thing of salvation or you've never been saved, you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, follow the Lord and believers' baptism, I'm telling you, don't play with this anymore. This is not about play in church. That's why I've been preaching up here for, for months now about the holy word place, about us trying to be real as much as we can in our sinful hearts, but under the Holy Spirit's direction to be a real church, for our doors to be open to all kinds of people. It doesn't matter if they're here to find the Lord. I don't care what your problem is in the world. I've said this before. God loves you just like you are, but he will not leave you just like you are. Okay? 
He will change you to his glory to make you fit for the kingdom that is to come, to be joint heirs with Jesus. Amen, y'all? Give the Lord a hand of praise. But now that we know what's happening, now that we know what's going on in the world, we can make some life adjustments, some prayer adjustments, some spiritual adjustments, some service adjustments. I mean, I mean, we can't buy our way into the kingdom. And I'm just saying, we need to invest our lives in God's people, in God's kingdom, in the world, whatever that is. I appreciate the people that put toilet paper in our bathrooms, don't y'all? And they do it every week. Praise God. You know, just how whatever you can do to just, to just minister in the people of, among the people of God, for the people of God, with the people of God, for and with the people of Israel, and, and innocent ones. I don't care what their religion or their faith. I don't want to see anybody's children get killed and wives get killed and worse, and their kids here, so I'm going to be careful with my words. I don't, I don't, I don't see that happen to anybody. I really don't want to see it happen to the non-innocent ones. I wish they would hit their knees and repent and come to Jesus Christ. I mean, that's what, that's what our heart needs to be. For God so loved the world, not just the Jews, not just the Baptist in Milton, Florida, not just Hicker Hammock. You know, I'm being silly now, but you know God so loved the world. And he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would hit their knees and come to him because soon the trumpet's going to blow. Soon, the ark, the door to the ark is going to close. Soon, the angels are going to show up in Sodom and Gomorrah. And soon, the wrath of God will fall, and those that are under the blood will be out of here. Amen. Give the Lord a hand. <laughs> Guys, I've run slap out of time. I could talk for two more hours. Can you imagine that? I, I know. You think, you say, Carl, you're exaggerating. Yeah, only a visitor might say that. <laughs> I'm not, but, and forgive me, I took a little longer than normal, and if you're a guest this morning, I don't usually preach this long, I preach five minutes longer than I usually do, but the, but the bottom line is, this is just stuff, I've been explaining this over and over and over and over, sometimes I go too detailed, sometimes I don't do enough, I don't know where I hit it today, I'm not fishing for any compliments or curses, <laughs> but I'm just saying, I, I think I spoke what God put on my heart, but I just want you to see from Genesis to Revelation, you see when I said literally, I wasn't lying. From Genesis to Revelation, that thread goes. And now it's all over internet, all over our televisions. Listen to me, 8 billion people, and I promise you, 7 billion people don't have a clue. They don't have a clue. I promise you. There are 2.8 billion people on the planet that claim to be Christians. Let's just say 3 billion. I guarantee you two-thirds of them don't have a clue. The world is in the days of Noah. It's just going on with life. Oh, those, those Jews, they'll, they'll figure it out. They'll handle it. And, well, if the Palestinian people win, well, they can't, maybe they deserved it anyway. I mean, that's how they don't have a clue. This is about the unseen realms. It's about the return of Jesus Christ. It's about a cosmic war that's already blowing up before us. We've got senators coming forth talking about UFOs and aliens. Senate committees talking about, they're here, they're among us. I mean, it's just the world's going out of its mind. And most of the people, the way they deal with it is, la, 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 tip through to the tulips. Only old people know what that means. <laughs> most of the world's dealing with it like that. And I'm saying, word of God has all your answers, has all the connections. And it all ends at the foot of Calvary's cross. It ends with the blood of Jesus. Get under the blood of Jesus, serve the Lord with your life, and then get on with life. Enjoy life and just know it's all in God's hand. We are the people. We are God's people. We are the sheep of his pasture. Today, if you have heard the voice of the Lord, listen to what he says. Do not turn your back, but come to him. God bless you. Let me pray.